Amen. Appreciate the good singing. Turn to Ephesians. When we are singing, scripturally, we are offering a sacrifice to the Lord. Doing our best, trying to sound our best, is not vain, it's not carnal. If we're doing it to the Lord and not for our neighbor, if we're trying to do our best to the, as a whole, our offering as a whole, as a group, is pleasing to the Lord, we ought to do our best. As I said in Sunday school, Satan is in the religion business. If it didn't matter, he wouldn't waste his time. Um, I think he's more busy joining churches than he is opposing churches. Mm. Uh, he's more busy, busy trying to lead churches and influence churches than oppose them. Satan has abused the concept of God's foreknowledge. Basically, any concept of Scripture, he's tried to take it and abuse it and slander God, cause division, cause controversy. There is no need for all the controversy that we see in the religious world today in, in Christianity, uh, Christendom, there's no need for all that. The Bible is not that unclear if people give themselves to listen and study and seek out the context and, and use common sense to understand. God is not that poor of a communicator. Right. Okay? Um, as a 19-year-old youth, I have things that I wrote at 19, trying to unravel the inconsistent loose ends of Baptist doctrine that I was raised in. And as a 19-year-old, having been converted at 15 and studied my Bible and, uh, for a few years, I could see that, that there were loose ends that needed to be dealt with. There was inconsistency. There were things that were said that didn't line up with other things that were said. And yet there are men who've gone through seminary, have doctor's degrees, and they're still spouting their inconsistencies. <clears throat> the Calvinist, and I'm going I'm to cover Calvinism just briefly, okay? Uh, because we're going into Ephesians and they, they like to abuse Ephesians. So it's good that we lay a, a little bit of a groundwork here. When the Calvinistic teachers in the Reformation began presenting their ideas of predestination, election, and so forth, uh, there was a group of ministers led by a man named Jacobus Arminius who put forth five points that they, where they disagreed with Calvin's five points. In response to that, the Calvinists came up with their five-point Calvinism. Now, the five points that Arminius put forward uh, to anybody who has common sense and knows the Bible it's just basic one plus one, no brainer. Okay, number one, election, which means God's choosing or acceptance into God's family, and also condemnation on the day of judgment, was conditioned by the rational faith or non faith of each person. Right. Duh. You ever read your Bible? Mm -hmm. Number two, the atonement while qualitatively adequate for all humans, was efficacious only for the person of faith. Right. Duh. We know this because Jesus, the high priest and administrator of his own sacrifice, of his own blood, applies it to those who believe and meet the terms of the, co the covenant, who submit to the terms of the covenant. Point number three, unaided by the Holy Spirit, no person is able to respond to God's will. Obviously, that means that God is, God is giving gracious ability. Mm -hmm. The Calvinists want to believe in inability, okay? God has given gracious ability, but we believe God in His justice gives that to all men. The Bible says God's Spirit strives with man, okay? Without that striving, we would go on in our stupidity and be damned for our own stupidity and, and sin. But God does strive with man, and he strives with every man because God is just. Okay? So when God shines light, he, he diffuses his light over the planet to all men. 
Now, those who receive that light, they get an extra dose. That's, that's the way it should be. If you're out in the forest and there's a, a light on your house and you're trying to find your way home, the more you move toward the light, the more light you get. Okay? Number four, grace is not irresistible. That would almost make someone want to laugh. The very nature of grace, okay, is irresistible. Or it's not grace, it's coercion. Number five, believers are able to resist sin but are not beyond the possibility of falling from grace. In other words, falling out of the realms where they deserve God's favor or are eligible for God's favor, let's say. <clears throat> now those, are, those five points Arminius put forward because of the stuff that was being taught. The Calvinist response was the tulip, T-U-L-I-P. The Calvinist response was, number one, total depravity. Man is morally incapable. The inability of man, he cannot repent, he cannot respond to God, he cannot cooperate with God. Number two, therefore God unconditionally elected some to salvation and some to damnation. Random selection. Uh, and the Calvinist says, well, they were all damned, so the fact that he chose to have mercy on some, um, you know, it's just. No, it's not. No. If they were all damned, they all need to be damned. But if, if mercy is available, if there's a merciful offer made, it needs to be made to all of them on the same conditions, or you are a partial judge. You're playing favorites, and you're not just. That's not hard to figure out, folks. God says he's not willing that any should perish. Do you ever read that? Oh, but the Calvinist says, no, but he's just talking about the elect. The Bible says, God is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. So the us word means it's to us the elect. Like, okay, hold it, hold it. So you believe that it's long-suffering for God to wait so that all the elect will be saved? If it's irresistible grace, who's God waiting on? He's waiting on himself. And that's not long-suffering. If you're waiting on your own predestination, it's not long-suffering. So they, they come up with these absurdities. Oh, God's just waiting on himself. God's waiting on the elect to get saved. And that's supposed to be grace and long-suffering. No. Okay, number three, the L, limited atonement. Jesus only died for those whom he unconditionally selected. Number four, irresistible grace. Those who were totally depraved and then unconditionally elected, and Jesus only died for them, God's grace makes them repent and believe with irresistible force called grace. That's not grace. That's irresistible force. That's coercion. Number five, the perseverance of the saints. That's the P of the tulip, okay? Perseverance of the saints means that all those who were irresistibly forced to believe and repent will continue in it. The problem with that is this. When's the last time you ever saw a Calvinist persevering in holiness? Oh, but no, they're just going to persevere in faith. Well, why would God use irresistible grace to make them believe and repent but not make them live holy? Yeah. God wants them to persevere in carnality? But that's what they do. They live carnal lives because they're so resting on their election. They don't labor to make their calling and election sure like Peter told them they better, which means they have something to do with it. Now, the saddest part about this whole thing is they're not joking. They actually believe this stuff. They're serious. And the thing is, it's not just a few a hokey pokey preachers off in the fringe. This is the majority of Protestantism. Lutherans, Presbyterians, the Baptists, the, the Evangelical Free, you know, John MacArthur and, and Chuck Swindoll and, and um, uh, Charles Stanley, the, you know, all the, the names on the, you hear on the radio. There's, there's a number of them out there, and they all believe this stuff, this Calvinism. And they think it's the, it's the Christian doctrine. I can read my Bible 
And don't have to read very far to know that God puts responsibility on man and tells him to do things and gets upset when they don't and punishes them when they don't obey. To me, that's enough. Calvinism boils down to absolute predestination. When the Calvinists began this nonsense, they were only thinking about God choosing to save some people because everybody seems so stupid out there that unless God actually smacked them upside the head and drug them into the camp, well, they'll never believe and repent. God has to do it. And a lot of people could sympathize with that feeling because it seemed like nobody really cares out there. Nobody's really wanting God. So the fact that some people repent and come must be God's doing and not their own because man just doesn't seem like he has it in him. We can sympathize with that idea. The problem is this. The Calvinists began by teaching this based on their feelings, based on their, their uh, perception, not on the Word of God. And they were only thinking of God electing and predestinating to make sure that somebody got saved. And they weren't thinking about the fact that if you choose one to get saved, you're choosing the others to go to hell. And so the matter of double predestination, uh, they wanted to stick to single predestination. God, God is helping people get saved. Well, that's grace, right? No, but God is also damning the other ones to hell. That's not grace. And how is it just if it's all a um, random process? Random selection. Anyways, as you can see, the devil, the author of confusion, by the way, has been working very hard to make Christianity look absurd. Make God look absurd. God is just. Whatever, whatever principle or whatever issue you come to, there is probably no principle repeated more often in Scripture than the fact that God is just impartial, rewards according to deeds of each person, okay? Nothing is probably re repeated more than that. God is just. And an impartial judge from the heart of pure benevolence would never do what Calvinists declare. His justice destroys their case from the bottom up. God is love. Love, your concept of love doesn't define God. God defines love. God's words are God's revelation of himself. Don't define God by your brain. Let God's words define God. God wants to be known by what he said. He wants to be known by his words. Put them all together. Harmonize them like they ought to be. That's, that's out of respect for the fact that he knows what he's talking about. Out of respect for the fact that he didn't forget what he said here when he said this. You put them in harmony. That's your responsibility if you have any confidence in God's uh, uh, ability to think and be consistent. You take all of his words and you let God be known by his words. God wants to be known by what he said. Doesn't everybody? Well, no, actually, wives want to be known by what they meant. God wants to be known by what he actually said, okay? There's a little difference there. But God wants a logical and rational and common sense evaluation of what he actually said to declare who he is. Now, there's no need arguing the tulip with the Calvinists. The root is predestination. The root is corrupt. The root is not biblical. Right. Let, me, let me read you a quote from John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley, who was very aware of what the Calvinists were teaching, in a sermon on free grace, um, he charged the Calvinists with making vain all preaching, tending to destroy holiness, the comfort of religion and zeal for good works, yea, the whole Christian revelation by involving it in fatal contradictions, a doctrine full of blasphemy. It represents our blessed Lord as a hypocrite, a deceiver of the people, a man void of common sincerity, as mocking his helpless creatures by offering what he never intends to give, by saying one thing and meaning another. He said it destroys, quote, all the attributes of God, his justice, mercy, and truth. Yea, it represents the most holy God as worse than the devil, as most both more false, more cruel, and more unjust. Mm -hmm. Now, before you begin to think that maybe Wesley's being too strong, 
Let me show you a quote from Martin Luther. Okay? Is that up there? Thus God conceals his eternal mercy and loving kindness beneath eternal wrath, his righteousness beneath unrighteousness. Now, the highest degree of faith is to believe that he is merciful, though he saved so few and damned so many, based on their Calvinistic brain, right? To believe that he is just, though he is of his own will, he makes us by force proper subjects of damnation, and seems, in Erasmus's words, to delight in the torments of poor wretches and to be a fitter object for hate than for love. If I could by any means understand how this same God, who makes such a show of wrath and unrighteousness, can yet be merciful and just, there would be no need for faith. What? What? So you think faith <coughs> is believing what the evidence is contrary to. The Bible says faith is conviction based on the evidence given. Mm -hmm. Faith is conviction based on evidence. These yo-yos believe that faith is believing that God is loving and just, though all the evidence is to the contrary. You don't get this garbage from the Bible, friends. You get it by theologians sitting and talking with other theologians who don't know God, who don't love the Bible, who don't love God's law, who probably have sin in their life, okay? Because the devil came up with Calvinism in order to charge God with his own Dereliction, okay? In other words, God made me this way. I can't help it. God made me to do this. And so it's God's fault, and the devil wants to throw it back on God. God says that the wicked are filthy dreamers, and the devil wants to throw it back on God that this whole creation experiment is God's filthy dream. That he, just, it's his, he wrote the play script, and we're all just acting it out. <coughs> So no, John Wesley wasn't being too harsh. That is nothing but wicked blasphemy. <clears throat> no, true, turn to Acts 17 quickly before we get into Ephesians. You say, Brother Mark, if we were trying to teach such stupidity, nobody would listen, nobody would follow, nobody would listen to us. And that's what always bothers me. It's like, I get so much opposition to trying to preach the Bible accurately, and yet there are wackos like Joseph Smith and like this and, and different ones who come up with all kinds of crazy stuff, and people flock to it and follow it. It's like, he must have some help that I don't have. Yeah. Yeah, the devil likes to help this kind of stuff. The devil wants this kind of doctrine being preached. Understand. If it wasn't, if there was no productivity for the devil in producing false doctrine, he wouldn't bother. If everybody being just sincere and stupid would go to heaven, the devil wouldn't bother with deception. But he spends a lot of time producing false doctrine and making Christians believe things that's counterproductive, doesn't represent God. In Acts 17, beginning in verse 23... We have true biblical predestination. We're going to talk about what that word means. Verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Okay? The word predestination is parizo. It means to limit in advance. Clark says of a parizo, signifies to define beforehand and circumscribe by certain bounds or limit and is originally a geographical term but applied also to anything concluded or determined or demonstrated. So in other words, there are some things that God predetermined 
and pre-limited, set bounds and limitations, okay? He wasn't going to let the world go on indefinitely. He was going to let it go for a certain time. He was going to let a king go for a certain time. He was going to let wickedness go for a certain time. Uh, there was a, only so much time, and then there was a flood. There was only so much time, and then Sodom and Gomorrah got burned up. Uh, there was only so much time before uh, Abraham's children were brought out of Egypt and given the law, and that only lasted so long before the Messiah came. These are bounds and limitations that God set. And Paul says that right there. But what does the next verse say? Mm -hmm. That they should seek the Lord if happily, if by chance, they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So, if I'm going to start a dairy, I'm going to set up my dairy barn, I'm going to set up gates and, 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 and uh, shoots and things, because I know cows pretty well, I know that I'm going to need a funnel type um, pasture where I can guide them and they'll all funnel into a gate and then you got to open this gate and move it. You got to know how to move them around to get them to do what you want to do. You got to have people in certain places and you can't have someone standing there because then they won't go that way. So you know how to manipulate these animals to get them in there, milk them, get them out. You know, put some feed in front of them. Okay, now, I am foreordaining what's going to happen there. Do I take away the cow's free will? No. No, they got plenty of that. Okay? I'm just making it to where they are going to do what I need them to do. And the ones who insist on not doing it, we'll deal with them separately. Okay? Um, so, in, in, a, in a similar sense, God has created the world. And God knows people very well. We have free will. We will all be dealt with according to that free will. Every man will be judged according to his deeds. That's just. Every man according to his deeds, according to his choices, what he did with what powers he had. That is just. But does God, does God know how to kind of corral them here and you know, get him to do this so that, so that his overall plan can be accomplished? Of course. Much better than I can guide my cows, no doubt. <clears throat> so, the calling of the patriarchs, the ordering of the ages, the establishing of a nation. He established a nation through Abraham. He called Abraham. It took him a while to get the person he wanted. Abraham was it. He worked with Abraham. Because he wanted to establish a nation. He wanted to establish a covenant. He wanted to establish a precedent for future generations. He told Abraham, your children are going to be in Egypt. In 430 years, I'm going to bring them out. And we're going to do such and such. But there was a time when those children of Israel were so obstinate and frustrating, God was willing to wipe them out and start over with Moses and start over working with Moses. God's got plenty of time. He could start over with Moses and still accomplish his overall redemption plan, right? That's what the Bible declares. So it wasn't just a script that God wrote that everybody was a puppet on stage and a pawn on the chessboard. That's not the way it works. If, if you believe that, you don't believe the Bible. <coughs> the Bible declares God being disappointed, God being pleased, uh, God getting upset, God punishing according to deeds all that means that man has free will so yes there is a foreordination of a plan there is a predestination the word predestination means limited beforehand planned and limited beforehand that's all been done but nowhere does the Bible declare that man is not responsible for his choices when God says when Jesus says O oh, Jerusalem of Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered thy children together under my wings as a hen gathers the chicks, and ye would not. That's a lie if there's predestination. That is what um, John Wesley said was making our, our Lord a hypocrite and, and more false than the devil by displaying a, a, a saying something that he knew was not true. 
If those people are predestined to act the way they act and they can't do anything else, then what he's saying is all just theatrical hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, I'm going to move on. <coughs> we know that God never commands and punishes those incapable of obedience. Spanking a blind child because they can't read something that they can't see. We would put you in the funny farm. Okay? God, God doesn't do those things. Uh, God only commands what is possible and rightly expected. Right. God only punishes where it is just and appropriate. God never shows partiality in judgment. If all deserve hell, all should get hell. And if a path of redemption is offered, it's offered to all without partiality. God never forces grace on anyone. He does force judgment on some because of their choices, and that's appropriate. But forcing grace on someone is, is not even what grace is. Okay? And uh, it doesn't take long reading the Bible to know that God declares all this of himself. And so to deny it or to slander it or to try to wrongly define it, to push your personal idea is blasphemy. Right. Now there's a link number three here, a uh, picture of our website. See that arrow up there? You go to that link right there and follow some of the links um, under that and, it, and you can study a lot about this matter of Calvinism and why we don't believe in it. Okay, on to the next slide. Ephesians. When did Paul write Ephesians? We'll turn to Acts 19, if you would. Not too long after he was in Athens and said what we just read. In uh, chapter 18, he made a short stop at Ephesus, went to the synagogue once, left Aquila and Priscilla there, and then he went on to Jerusalem. On his third missionary journey then, he came back, uh, started here and went through uh, Galatia and the, the, where his first missionary journey was. And then he went to Ephesus and spent two years there. While in Ephesus there, he wrote 1 Corinthians. So in Acts uh, 9, 19.8, <clears throat> But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So Paul was in Ephesus, and he went into the synagogues until they kicked him out, and then he, he separated the disciples, verse 10, and continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the, disease, the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. <coughs> right after that, it talks about the seven sons of Sceva and what happened there. And so Paul comes to Ephesus. He hears about the problems in Corinth. He writes the letter to Corinth. He stays there for two years, and then he leaves after the uproar. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And he goes up through Macedonia, writes 2 Corinthians, uh, then eventually goes down to Achaia where Corinth is, spends the winter there, that's where he writes Galatians and Romans, and then after the winter, he goes back up through, he was going to go on this way, but the Jews laid in wait, so he went back up through, he goes to Troas where uh, Eutychus falls out the window when they're having their meeting, then he sails down, he touches at Miletus and calls the, the Ephesian elders, talks to them, goes down to Jerusalem, gets arrested. Okay, after his arrest, he's in Caesarea for two years. Then he goes back to Rome, where he's in there another two years. And while he's in Rome in prison, he writes to the Ephesians. Okay, so it's about nine years after that first visit where he left Aquila and Priscilla, and about six years after he stayed there for two years that he goes back and uh, he, he stayed there for two years. Six years later, he writes to the Ephesians from Rome. So Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ is the key. 
us who are in Christ, the saints at Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. We're talking about the covenant family and those in the covenant family. Okay? These blessings don't apply to you until you are in the covenant family, in the covenant with God, in the household of Christ, which is called in Christ, okay? And if you ever leave that, it doesn't apply to you anymore. So these blessings are applying to those who are active members in Christ. And if you fall away or if you leave that situation, it doesn't apply to you anymore. So just because while you're in there, you are blessed with heavenly blessings in Christ Jesus and, and you have a home in heaven and you have an inheritance and all this kind of stuff, that applies to you while you're in covenant. That's not hard to understand. But if you leave that, you, you have forfeited that. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that's the word cosmos, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. There's two words that you need to understand clearly. One is cosmos, and the other one is the word where we get our English word eon. It's aeon in the Greek. They both are translated world. And sometimes they're both in the exact same verse, translated world, and you in the English read world both times, but they're two different words. And so we need to know what these words mean. The word cosmos, uh, both translated world. The word cosmos means order, orderliness, or orderly arrangement. It doesn't mean space. It doesn't mean the universe. It doesn't mean the planet. Okay? It doesn't mean the creation of the world. The context determines its meaning in every verse. So, before the foundation of the order, the orderly arrangement, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. So, <clears throat> let's talk about this. 1 Timothy 2.9 says, In like manner also that women adorn cosmio themselves in modest cosmios apparel. So we could say, the Bible says our women should dress in space suits. No. It's interesting that the same word translated world, love not the world, is translated, is the same root word, is the word used for modest. So we could say our women should wear worldly clothes. But that's not what it means either. Every Bible translator knows we're dealing with an order. Okay? Uh, China has an order. America has an order, but they're not the same order, okay? The world has an order that we're not supposed to love. But there is a proper order for women's clothes that they're supposed to dress like. And it's supposed to be orderly according to God's design for them. In 1 Peter 3, 3, when it says, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning. The word adorning there means is cosmos. Whose cosmos let it not be the outward cosmos. Whose orderliness, let it not be that outward orderliness of plating the hair, wearing gold, putting on of apparel. That's not the orderliness that God wants you to have. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the cosmos is enmity with God? So you throw away your telescope, you can't look at the stars. No, that's not what it's talking about, is it? It's not talking about the cosmos that we think of as a cosmos. It's talking about the order of the world, the arrangement of the world. Um, 2 Peter 2.20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the cosmos through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we know that verse. 1 John 2.15, Love not the cosmos, neither the things that are in the cosmos. If any man love the cosmos, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the cosmos, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the cosmos. 1 John 4, 5, they are of the cosmos, therefore speak they of the cosmos, and the cosmos heareth them. 1 John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the cosmos. And this is the victory that overcometh the cosmos, even our faith. 1 John 5, 5, who is he that overcometh the cosmos, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so you see that the word cosmos doesn't mean the planet. <clears throat> But it's interesting, in 2 Peter 2, 5, 
it says that God, he spared not the old world, cosmos, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And then in chapter 3, verse 6, Peter says, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And the heavens and the earth, which are now, obviously the flood didn't destroy the heavens and the earth. But that arrangement was different than our arrangement because the windows of heaven were open. They had a different atmosphere than we have. But it's the same planet. But the heavens and the earth, the cosmos they had, is different than the cosmos we have. And though the Bible says, <coughs> uh, whereby the world that then was perished, being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So, a social order, a civilization uh, that exists now is different from a social order and civilization that existed in the past. So we say we are in a different world, a different cosmos. Um, so, in context of Second Peter, before the present cosmos, before the foundation of our world, could just mean before the flood. We're not done yet, though. But I'm just saying, technically, it could mean that. The context determines usage. Now, the second word is aion, where we get our word eon. It means age or perpetuity. It means whole duration. So, it's also, it's translated eternal, but when it's referring to the, uh, the complete realm of a term, the word eternal means the complete term. If a president has been in there eight years, he has, well, four years, he's had a complete term, right? So the word eternal is also used for the completion of a whole, of a unit. Adam Clark says, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says this, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon wh whom the ends of the world are come. That was 2,000 years ago, okay? The ends of the aeon, the age. So what's he talking about? Um, Clark says, upon whom the ends of the age are come, the end of the times included within the whole duration of the Mosaic economy. For also, although the word aeon means in its primary sense, endless being or endless duration, yet in its accommodated sense, it is applied to any round or duration that is complete in itself. And here it evidently means the whole duration of the Mosaic economy. And by, a word, by the by way, as a, as a side note, the word dispensation in the scripture comes from the Greek where we get our word economy. Um, it's oikonomia. We get our word economy. But that's where the Bible gets the word dispensation. <coughs> so the complete dispensation, the perpetual duration and complete term, that's how the word is used. So pay attention. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. It's important to understand the terms used in the scripture uh, properly. Hebrews 9 and verse 24. I want you to listen to the train of thought, listen to the logic, and the point being made. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. That's the earthly tabernacle, temple, whatever. Which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. For yet that, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. Okay, that was the day of atonement. The, holy pri the priest entered into the holy place every year on the day of atonement with the blood of others. It says here, verse 26, for then must he, Christ, often have suffered since the foundation of the cosmos. Okay? But now, 
once in the end of the aeon hath he appeared to put away sin by a sacrifice of himself. Now what cosmos and aeon, obviously they're using them interchangeably. What order are we talking about? <clears throat> the foundation of the world. When were animal sacrifices in the temple, the Day of Atonement, started? Well, it started with the Mosaic economy. And so now, once in the end of that Mosaic economy, he's appeared to end those sacrifices by the sacrifice of himself. Now, that is what Adam Clark says. Um, in other words, it would mean, for then must he often have suffered since the beginning of this order of offering sacrifices. But now, once in the end of the age, which would actually uh, literally be translated the end of the endless or the completion of the whole term of temple sacrifice in the earthly temple, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So they're contrasting Christ instead of he was sacrificed in type for 1500 years before he was sacrificed in reality once in the end. Okay. Otherwise, he would have suffered often as the priest entering every uh, year into the, to the temple. Now, <clears throat> this could also mean <coughs> from the beginning of the offering of sacrifices to the end of the offering of sacrifices. That would take it outside the realm of the Mosaic economy to Adam and Eve until Christ, until the destruction of Jerusalem. From Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, there were animal sacrifices commanded by God and God ordained. Today there are not. Okay? And previous to Adam and Eve in the garden, when they fell and God killed the innocent lamb and clothed them, and then we know that Abel knew to bring a blood sacrifice for a sin offering. Cain knew too, but he didn't do it. Okay, we know all that. From that time until AD 70, animal sacrifices were ordained of God as a type of Christ. So let me read that verse again. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Okay, if he, if he was in the holy place made with hands, that's the beginning of the Mosaic economy, he would have had to suffer often which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world, suffered often since uh, the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So what does world mean? If you look at all these commentaries, it's interesting. This is what you'll see. If you look at the commentaries that say from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, if they're Calvinists, they all say, well, from time eternal, you know, in the mind of God, pre foreordained, blah, blah, blah. If you look up the verses that say in the end of the world, like right here, mm -hmm. they all say consistently the end of the age, the end of the dispensation. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. You can't have it both, right. okay? If Christ came in the end of the world and you say he would have suffered since the foundation of the world, we're talking about the end and the beginning of the same right. period, mm -hmm. all right? The beginning of the animal sacrifices to the end of the animal sacrifices. And in Revelation 13:8, it says this, <coughs> and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of, the, of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, according to Hebrews, that slain from the foundation of the world was in type, right? He didn't suffer from the foundation of the world. Hebrews says otherwise. He came once in the end of the world. But he's, the book of life is for the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In, in all the little lambs that were slain, he was slain in type, in the mind of God, in the plan of God. Okay, from the foundation of the world. Well, what was the foundation of the world? It wasn't in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't until after the fall. There was no lamb slain in the Garden of Eden before the fall, right? Mm -hmm. So before the foundation of this era, 
before the foundation of this age, before the foundation of the age of offering sacrifices, would be in the Garden of Eden, before the fall. Let's go on. <clears throat> Uh, before the world means before these dispensations began. 2 Timothy 1 9. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That's chronos aenos. In other words, before the time of this age, before the present ages. That would be in the Garden of Eden as well. And one more verse will prove it. Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. When did God promise salvation? And to whom did he promise it? Did he promise salvation to the angels before the world was ever created? No. Did he promise it to Adam and Eve before they fell? No. No, but in Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And in Romans 16.20, Paul says, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. There was a promise there. There was a promise made before the present ages. Okay, now. <clears throat> The point that Paul is making in all this has nothing to do with what the Calvinists call predestination. He's writing to Gentile Christians, and this is the point he wants to make. That God's plan in calling the Gentiles together along with the Jews into one house, into one salvation plan, happened before Judaism, mm. happened before circumcision. It was God's plan from the start. It was not an afterthought. It was not plan B because the Jews messed up. It was the original plan for God to save the nations, for God to offer salvation to all mankind. It was the original plan. And as we go into Ephesians, you will see that clearly, but I wanted to uh, help you to see it. <clears throat> God's plan in the... New Testament church of bringing Jew and Gentile together predated Judaism. In Romans 3.29, he's arguing the same thing. And he says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. In Romans 4.7, he's, he's the same theme that he goes in Ephesians. Okay, In Romans 4.7, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He's talking about justification by faith. Whose iniquities are forgiven. Whose sins are washed away. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Or upon the uncircumcision also? And that is the, that is the big question that's being covered when Paul is writing to Gentile churches. It's not about Calvinism. It's not about predestination of, of uh, salvation or damnation. It's about assuring the Gentile believers this is the original plan from the foundation of the world. When God first promised salvation, he planned to save everybody because the fact is there were no Jews at that time. Abraham, when he received circumcision, he's going to say right here, um, Come with this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? When he was in what they would call Jewishness now or Gentilism? And the answer is not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal or a symbol of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. <coughs> Very important. The Jews wanted to monopolize on salvation. And like it was only for us and it wasn't for the Gentiles. And God revealed to the apostles that look, salvation was planned and designed, the program was there before Jewishness ever existed, right. before Judaism was ever set up, before circumcision, before Abraham, from the foundation of the world, before the present ages happened, from the Garden of Eden. 
Okay, the Bible tells us when he promised it. The Bible tells us when his promise began. It predated Judaism. And so, <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, <coughs> to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Um, <clears throat> the, the Gentile believers would naturally feel very insecure coming in, being grafted in to the covenant. God made a new covenant with Israel. And the Gentiles were grafted in. But these Gentile believers coming in were complete in Him. They didn't need to go to Judaism. They didn't need circumcision. That's what Galatians is all about. You Gentile believers don't have to go under the Sanhedrin. You don't have to become Jews. You come in and you follow Jesus Christ and you follow the moral law of God and you draw an eye to God through the sacrifice of Christ from Gentilism. Jews had a problem with that. That's what Acts 15 controversy is about. That's what all the Judaizing is about. This was the struggle in the New Testament. So the point Paul makes in Ephesians to a Gentile church while Paul's in prison is to assure them that what you have in Christ is plan A. What you have in Christ was established before the present ages, before the Mosaic economy, before circumcision, <coughs> promised back in the Garden of Eden. This was the original plan. Has nothing at all to do with me as an individual being elected unconditionally to salvation before God ever created the planet. Nothing to do with that. Okay? The, the whole Bible speaks contrary to that. The whole Bible teaches us that man is commanded, all men everywhere, commanded to repent, turn from sin. Paul preached, repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Obviously, to say that to people who he knew most of them can't even do that is a bunch of dishonesty. I would never think of such a scheme. Who are these guys who make the whole Bible that way? Can we trust these guys? These guys whose idea of God and justice is so warped and messed up, can we trust them? No. No. If they think it's okay for God to lie and deceive, if they think it's okay for God to say something that they don't really mean, what are they going to do? What kind of guys are we dealing with here? If I believe that that's what God did, how much would I be tempted to do the same? But if I believe that God is honest and just and appropriate, it's going to motivate me to be perfect even as my Father in heaven is perfect, like Jesus said. That's what I'm commanded to be. It's not, well, well, God can be arbitrary and unjust, but we've got to be honest and up. That's nonsense. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I'm supposed to learn what righteousness is by watching Him. I learn justice by watching Him. I learn mercy by watching Him. I learn appropriateness by studying Him. So, brothers and sisters... As we go through Ephesians, which we run out of time for today, when we go through Ephesians, the word predestination means foreordained, predetermined, limited beforehand, boundary set beforehand. That's what it means. He's talking about God's program. He's talking about the bride, the program, the covenant of the redeemed. If I'm in that covenant family, then I have eternal inheritance and, and I have all the blessings of the covenant. I have a high priest. My sins are washed away. I'm accepted in the beloved. That's what this package deal is all about. But there's nothing that declares that I can't walk away from it. The Bible declares the opposite, that I can walk away from it. The Bible declares that I have to repent to get into it 
And I can walk away from it. I can neglect it. I can neglect it in such a way that my heart will be hardened and my mind diluted and I will leave it. Scripture after scripture in the Bible declares that. Mm -hmm. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. We just sang it this morning. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. As long as those words are in the Bible, no Calvinist has any excuse That's right. for believing the stupidity that he believes. That's right. Don't call God a liar because you're one. Yeah. Don't say, well, God said all this, but he really meant something totally opposite. Really, is that the way you operate? Let's stand together. How would you like to have Martin Luther for your pastor? Well, all the evidence says that God is cruel, unjust, unrighteous, his own words, that God cloaks his righteousness beneath unrighteousness. Come on. What is that? How do you do that? How do you cloak righteousness under unrighteousness? How do you cloak injustice, or how do you cloak justice beneath injustice? If, if what we see is injustice, that's what's happening. No, the, 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 talk about confused. Like, what Bible are you reading, buddy? Obviously, someone who could believe that seems to have issues with God. Mm -hmm. I can't believe someone truly loving the Father as his <clears throat> beloved Father. I mean, you sing the song of Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther, and you get a different idea. But that's what Calvinists do. Where they live is in the realm of human responsibility and true grace. But when they, they get their theologue brain out and they start uh, theorizing about theology, they get into total absurdity and stupidity. As though they're two different worlds, no? Practical Christianity is doctrinal Christianity. Right. Doctrine can't be way over there and practical here. You can't tell me that you're a total pacifist, and then at the same time say, but don't break into my house. No, you're just dishonest. You're just too much of a coward to stand up for what you know is true because all your friends are pacifists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't have any patience for that. Don't tell me that, like Toplady in his song, or, or Martin Luther, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Um, all our striving would be failing, we're not the right man on our side. Really? You, you believe that you've got to cooperate with God? That's not Calvinism. Toplady says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. It's like, that's not Calvinism. I was discussing Calvinism with a Calvinist recently, and they said that they were talking about Paul saying, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. And they said, see, Paul, Paul realized that that uh, God's intervention into his life and so forth was not inconsistent with what he was saying. I said, hold it! You don't believe in God's intervention. I do. It's synergism. Mm -hmm. You believe in monergism. You believe in predestination. That's not God's intervention. That's God's total control. Right. I believe that Without the mercy of God, we'd all fail. That we've got to have his help. That we've got to have his intervention. I believe in synergism. Synergism is not monergism. Right. But see, they, they can't keep it straight because their mind, the little bit of common sense wants to revert to the obvious. Synergism is obvious in the Bible. Monergism is something that is forced. Right. And so as they, when they go out evangelizing and they start witnessing to a sinner, they revert to synergism. But if you start talking theology, they revert back to monergism as though, no, this... Yes. You, you talk to them and you'll see. Yeah, we don't... They're not the ones that believe that, well, we got to have the Holy Ghost working in our life. We're the ones that believe that. Right. When it's predestination, you don't have the Holy Ghost working in your life. It's all just clockwork. Click, click, click. Just like it was predetermined, right? 
Okay. Any thoughts? Any thoughts before we close? Just to, and, and think that somehow you've got a better knowledge of what this hammer's potential is. Why don't you just pound a nail with it? You can see a saw and you can try to imagine how it could be used to do something weird. Why don't you just saw the board with it? And whenever we, <clears throat> we have a game, and before we start the game, we explain the rules. Okay? We set the boundaries. You can't go past that fence. Out of bounds. Right? Yeah. If you get tagged, you have to be on the other team, or you have to stay there until someone frees you, or who knows what it is. You set the rules. You, does that mean that we're just all staged and, and, and playing a certain script for a movie scene or something? Does that mean that it's all predetermined who's going to win, when you're going to be caught, you have to make sure that you get caught on time according to how you're told when you're supposed to be caught, and you run you know, exact speed and exact direction that you're told before the game started, you're supposed to. It, it's obvious. We do it every day in our daily life. We understand that you just told the rules. Right. You and didn't. Paul you says didn't. to Timothy, any man strives for mastery, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. There are boundaries. Exactly. But it's, it's sad whenever it seems like people come to the Bible realizing that it's it's deep, and there's some things they don't understand, and so they just assume everything's a mystery, and they let their imagination become overactive. Yeah. And things that God makes very clear and plain, they try to imagine how it could be more mysterious. And once somebody makes a point, and this is evident in Luther's writing with their absence, <coughs> once they make a point, they hate to back down from their point. And so they keep pushing it and trying to pile more evidence on it, and it just gets a bigger pile of mess. <clears throat> Any other thoughts before we go to prayer? I would wonder that quote from Martin Luther, that was kind of foundational for his whole belief system, but how often did he actually state that to his listeners? Yeah. So how many people actually knew that down at the core of his being, this is his view? Mm -hmm. That's the idea of, well, this, why would I need faith, makes me go, <laughs> your concept of faith is totally messed up. <clears throat> that's the big problem, and that's the problem with preacher and preacher today, is the ignorance of the listeners, and a, another well, person that knows the topic, to have the opportunity to... Uh, challenge them openly would reveal a lot of that stuff because when you know the doctrine and you know the arguments, you can push that person in a private room somewhere respectfully to say things that they would, their congregation would gasp at because their congregation doesn't know how that when he says that, you say, wait a minute, what about what God said here and what about this and push those points, know the way the crowd works and put him in the head gate, so to speak, and the congregation never sees them have to totally uh, admit things about God. They're like, my pastor doesn't slander God. His doctrine slanders God. No, it doesn't. I, he's never, I've never heard him say, hey, he's only talking about loving God. Like, no, no, no. If you heard that doctrine get challenged, you would see him slander God. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, that, and, yeah, probably... A lot of people didn't hear Martin Luther say that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that they have that their doctrine says that they don't say. That's why I say, don't bother arguing the tulip. <clears throat> the root is predestination. It's corrupt from the root. Right. And, and what they want to do is avoid that. They want to look at the petals. They don't want to look at the root. Right. Let's pray. Pray for the Calvinists. A lot of them are sincerely deceived. 